Hi, my name is Eric Haynes with NVIDIA, and this talk is about the ray tracing pipeline. I'd like to start with a quote, and this one's from Matt Farr around the year 2008. GPUs are the only type of parallel processor that has ever seen widespread success because developers generally don't know they are parallel. Rasterization and ray tracing both make use of parallelism. Rasterization is straightforward in that you send a triangle to the screen, you do vertex shading, you do pixel shading, and then whatever the result is, you do a raster operation to blend it into the screen. With ray tracing, we have a similar kind of flow. You start with a ray, you traverse the environment, and then you shade it. However, at this point, we actually have the ability to recurse, to go back to the beginning and shoot more rays, to spawn off more possibilities such as shadow rays or reflection rays. This bottom part in the green box is what we actually do with RTX acceleration, as we can do that traversal and intersection piece very rapidly. In DirectX for ray tracing and in Vulkan for ray tracing, there are five new kinds of shaders that are added. There's a ray generation shader, and what that does is it's kind of the manager. It basically starts the ray going and keeps track of it and gets its final result. There are intersection shaders, so if you wanted to intersect a sphere, you'd have an intersection shader for that, or a subdivision surface, or whatever you want. There's a different kind of shader for each one. Then there's these last three shaders, which are sort of a group. There's a mist shader, which says, well, I shot a ray and it didn't hit anything. What do I get? There's a closest hit shader, which is, well, I hit something, what shall I do with it? Kind of a traditional shader. But you can also spawn off rays at that point, such as reflection or shadow. And there's also any hit shaders, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. So just to sum up again, we have the ray generation shader, which controls all the shaders. There's the intersection shader, which essentially defines the object shape. And there are these control per ray behavior shaders, miss, closest hit, and any hit. So how do these fit together? Well, there's the complicated many boxes kind of version here. Here's the simple version of that same flowchart. What we do is we have a trace ray, which is called to generate the ray, and then it goes into this acceleration structure loop where we walk through the bounding volume hierarchy and find out objects that could potentially be hit by the ray. The intersection shader is then applied to that object, and if we hit, and if it's the closest hit, we keep track of that information. We also then use the any hit shader, if available, for testing if the object's transparent and the ray should actually just continue on. Once we get through this traversal loop, we eventually get to the end where there's nothing else in the acceleration structure to hit. It's gone through the whole bounding volume hierarchy. And now we take our closest hit and say, OK, what's that shaded as? Or if we missed everything, then we use our miss shader, and that's what color we get back for the pixel. The any hit shader I wanted to talk about a little bit more. It's an optional shader. It's one that basically is used for transparency. So imagine you have this leaf on the right, which you're doing a tree of leaves, and so you're not really caring about each individual leaf. So you really just take a rectangle and you put a texture of a leaf on it. Now much of that texture is empty, it's blank, it's transparent. So what the any hit shader does is it goes and checks the texture. So let's say I hit with my ray in the upper left-hand corner of that rectangle, the any hit shader would say, oh, well, that's transparent, so don't really count this as a hit, and let's just keep going. So real-time ray tracing can clearly be used for games. Here are three shipping titles that are showing reflections, global illumination, and shadows. What's also cool about real-time ray tracing or interactive ray tracing, accelerated ray tracing, is that you can use it for all kinds of other things. For example, you can do faster baking. Baking is where you shoot lots and lots of rays it's an offline process that takes a bit, and you basically bake the results into a bunch of texture maps. I was reading about how one studio went from 14 minutes of bake time to 16 seconds of bake time once they switched over to GPU ray tracing. Even if you don't want to use ray tracing, particularly in your title, you can use it for a ground truth test. Shaders that are part of DirectX can be used on any machine. You can basically put your shaders into a ray tracer and get the correct answer. So if you're trying to do some approximation, you can always get the ground truth and know what you're aiming for, and then back off and try to figure out you know, what your faster method might be. The other cool thing you can do with ray tracing hardware is that you can abuse it. <laughs> in other words, we're now looking into researching ideas of what else could we do with this? Could we do collision detection? Or could we do volume rendering? Or could we do other kinds of queries? And work is just starting on this. And I think it's a really interesting open field where there's all kinds of possible ways we can use and abuse the new hardware. And that's it for this talk. 
For more information about ray tracing and plenty of other good free resources such as free books, go to this website. You can also get a free book that's very modern and full of all kinds of articles about practice of how to use real-time rendering. It's called Ray Tracing Gems and it's downloadable.